As the earnings from Indian cricket have grown in the past two decades, mainly through television, the BCCI has spread the revenues to various pockets in the country and improved, the, and improved where we play. The field is now spread wider than it has ever been. The ground covered by Indian cricket has shifted. 27 teams compete in our national championship, the Ranji Trophy. Last season, Rajasthan, a state best known for its palaces, fortresses and tourism, won the title for the first time in its history. The National One Day Championship was also won for the first time by Jharkhand, a state from which MS Dhoni, our captain, comes. The growth and scale of cricket on our television was the engine of this population shift. Like Bradman was the boy from Baural, a stream of Indian cricketers now come from what you can call India's outback. Zaheer Khan belongs to the Maharashtra heartland, from a town that didn't have even one proper turf wicket. He could have been an instrumentation engineer, but was drawn to cricket through TV and modeled his bowling by practicing in front of the mirror on his cupboard at home, and first bowled with a proper cricket ball at the age of 17. One day out of nowhere, a boy from a village in Gujarat turned up as India's fastest bowler. After Munaf Patel made his debut for India, the road from the nearest railway station to his village had to be improved because journalists and TV crews from the cities kept landing up there. <laughs> we are delighted that Umesh Yadav didn't become a policeman like he was planning and turned to cricket instead. He is the first cricketer from the Central Indian first class team of Vidarbha to play test cricket. Virendra Sehwag, and, and this shouldn't surprise anyone, belongs to the Wild West, just outside Delhi. <laughs> he had to be enrolled in a college which had a good cricket program and travel 84 kilometers every day by bus to get to practice and matches. Every player in this room wearing an India blazer has a story like this. Here, ladies and gentlemen, is the heart and soul of Indian cricket. Playing for India completely changes our lives. The game has given us a chance to pay back our debt to all those who gave of their time, energy, resources for us to be better cricketers. We can build new homes for our parents, get out siblings married off in style, give our families very comfortable lives. The Indian cricket team is in fact India itself in microcosm. A sport that was played first by princes, then by their subordinates, then the urban elite, is now a sport played by all of India. Cricket, as my two under-19 teammates proved, is India's most widely spoken language. Even Indian cinema has its regional favorites. A movie star in the, south, in the south may not be as popular in the north, but a cricketer loved everywhere. It is also a very tough environment to grow up in. Criticism can be severe. Responses to victory and defeat, extreme. There are invasions of privacy and stones have been thrown at our homes after some defeats. It takes time getting used to. Extreme reactions can fill us with anger. But every cricketer realizes at some stage of his career that the Indian cricket fan is best understood by remembering the sentiment of the majority, not the actions of a minority. One of the things that has always lifted me as a player was looking out of the team bus when we traveled somewhere in India. When people see the Indian bus go by, see some of us sitting with our curtains drawn back, it always amazes me how much they light up. There is an instantaneous smile, directed not just at the player they see, but at the game that we play, that for whatever reason means something to people's lives. Win or lose, the man on the street will smile and give you a wave. After India won the World Cup this year, our players were not congratulated as much as they were thanked by the people they ran into. You have given us everything, they were told. All of us have won. Cricket in India now stands not just for sport, but possibility, hope, opportunity. On our way to the Indian team, we know so many of our teammates, some of whom may have been equally or more talented than those sitting here, who missed out. When I started out for a young Indian, cricket was the ultimate gamble. All or nothing. No safety nets. No second chances for those without an education or a college degree or second careers. Indian cricket's wealth now means a wider pool of well-paid cricketers even at the first class level. For those of us who make it to the Indian team, cricket is not merely our livelihood. It is a gift we have been given. Without the game, we would just be average people leading average lives. As Indian cricketers, our sport has given us the chance to do something worthwhile. How many people could say that? This is the time Indian cricket should be flowering. We are the world champions in the short game, 
and over the space of the next 12 months should be involved in a tight contest with Australia, South Africa and England to determine which one of us is the world's strongest test team. Yet I believe this is also a time for introspection within our game, not only in India, but also all over the world. We have been given some alerts and responding to them quickly is the smart thing to do. I was surprised a few months ago to see the lack of crowds in a, in a one-day series featuring India. By that, by that I don't mean the lack of full houses. I think it was the sight of empty stands I found somewhat alarming. India played its first one-day international at home in November 1981, when I was nine. Between then and now, India has played 227 ODIs at home. The October five-match series against England was the first time that the grounds have not been full for an ODI featuring the Indian team. In the summer of 1998, I played a one-dayer against Kenya in Kolkata, and Eden Gardens was full. Our next game was held in the 48 degrees heat of Gwalior, and the stands were heaving. The October series against England was the first one at home after India's World Cup win. It was called the Revenge Series, meant to wipe away the memory of a forgettable, for, forgettable, forget, sorry, forgettable tour of England. India kept winning every game, and yet the stands did not fill up. Five days after a 5-0 victory, 95,000 turned up to watch India's first Formula One race. A few weeks later, I played in a test match against the West Indies in Calcutta in front of what was the lowest turnout in Eden Gardens history. Yes, we still wanted to win and our intensity did not dip. But at the end of the day, we are performers, entertainers, and we love an audience. The audience amplifies everything you're doing. The bigger the crowd, the bigger the occasion, its magnitude, its emotion. When I think about the Eden Gardens crowd this year, I wonder what the famous Calcutta test of 2001 would have felt like with 50,000 people less watching us. Australia and South Africa played an exciting and thrilling test series recently. Two great test matches produced some fantastic performances from players of both teams, but was played in front of sparse crowds. It's not the numbers test players need, it is the atmosphere of a test that every player wants to revel in and draw energy from. My first reaction to the lack of crowds for cricket was that there had been a lot of cricket and so perhaps a certain amount of spectator fatigue. That is too simplistic a view. It is an easy thing to say, but that might not be the only thing. The India versus England series had no context because the two countries had just played each other in four tests and five one days just recently. When India and West Indies played ODIs a month after that, the grounds were full. But this time, matches were played in smaller venues that didn't host too much international cricket. Maybe our clues are all there and we must remain vigilant. Unlike Australia or England, Indian cricket has never had to compete with other sports for a share of revenues, mind space, or crowd attendance at international matches. The lack of crowds may not directly impact on revenues or how important the sport is to Indians, but we do, but we do need to accept that there has definitely been a change in temperature over, I think, the last two years. Whatever the reasons are, maybe it's too much cricket or too little by way of comfort for spectators, the fan has sent us a message and we must listen. This is not mere sentimentality. Empty stands do not make for good television. Bad television can lead to a fall in ratings. The fall in ratings will be felt by media planners and advertisers looking elsewhere. If that happens, it is hard to see television rights around cricket being as sought after as they have always been in the last 15 years. And where does that leave everyone? I'm not trying to be an economist or a doomsday prophet. This is just how I see it. 